Okay, so you might be wondering why am I reviewing Jaws since it's not a giant monster movie. Movie. Well, it features a monster, and the movie has monster movie tropes in it, so it counts. Let's begin. <laughs> In 1974, producer Richard D. Zunick, what a weird last name, and John Brown, and John Brown, David Brown, excuse me, both heard of the success of Peter Benchley's original novel of the same name. Brown came across the book in a literature section of lifestyle magazine Cosmopolitan. Upon opening it, a small card written by a magazine editor gave the specific details of the story, and with a comment of, quote, might make a good movie. Can't say that didn't motivate him, and he went to do just that. Originally, Zunick and Brown wanted veteran filmmaker at the time, John Sturge. But after many pleas and convincing, it was, it was decided that Steven Spielberg would direct this project. As for the project itself, Spielberg wanted to stay to the novel story, but he had to remove some subplots from said story. His favorite part of the book was the shark chase and told Zenuk, I'd like to do the picture if I could change the first two acts and base the first two acts on original screenplay material and then be very true to the book for the last third. Spielberg also noted that the characters in Benchley's script were still unlikable, like in the original novel, to which, let's be honest here, he's right. So he hired a young screenwriter, John by room bleh, to write to rewrite the script but what about the actual shark itself well here's where it gets interesting so with a budget of at the time nine million us dollars you would think of how to show the shark more frequently right well that would have happened if it wasn't for that life science mechanical puppet Many crew members were disgruntled at the fact that a robo shark would be the equivalent of an average everyday laptop. <clears throat> and even going so far as to call it flaws. Ouch. Spielberg attributed it to this and said, I could have shot the movie in the tank or even a protected lake somewhere, but it would not have looked the same. And as for his lack of experience, he said, I was naive about the ocean, basically. I was pretty naive about Mother Nature and hubris of a filmmaker who thinks he can conquer the elements of what was foolhardy. But I was too young to know I was being foolhardy when I demanded that we shoot the film in the Atlantic Ocean and not on a North Hollywood tank. Many, many delays of unwanted sailboats, a boat for the actual movie sinking cameras getting soaked and the actual prop shark not working on a daily basis was more hell on well literal high waters for the production team and then suddenly a resolution with the script being redefined during production spielberg came to the conclusion that they would have to shoot many scenes so that the beast was hinted at not shown 
case in point, the floating yelling, yeah, yelling, <laughs> yeah, yelling yellow barrels. <laughs> no, the floating yellow barrels. There we go. And Spielberg decided to film the shark without filming the shark. What do I mean by that? He would use an underwater camera in order to show off the shark's point of view. He also commented, commented years later in an interview that the shark not working was a godsend. It made me become more like Alfred Hitchcock than like Ray Harryhausen. The more fake the shark looked in the water, the more anxiety told me to heighten the naturalism of the performances. And well, and all of that really paid off in the end when Jaws was released on June 20th, 1975, ranking in what was a record at the time, $7 million in one weekend, and would go on to make a whopping $470 Point seven million U.S. dollars in the box office just for inflation. The movie was praised to the moon and back by critics and audiences. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times was one of those critics saying it was, in his words, a sensationally effective action picture, a scary thriller that works all the better because it's populated with characters that have been developed into human beings. The New Yorker's Pauline Kael said it was the most cheerfully perverse scary movie ever made. Judith Christ, don't know why it's spelled like that, writer of New York Magazine, described it as an exhilarating adventure entertainment of the highest order, while also praising the acting and extraordinary te technical achievements. And lastly, Rex Reed praised the nerve-frying action scenes, as he called it, and concluded with, for the most part, Jaws is a gripping horror that works beautifully in every department. I, myself, first watched Jaws on Halloween of 2015. Yeah, how fitting. A scary movie on Halloween. Who would have thunk? And I thought, it was an amazing movie. But do I still hold those thoughts now? Well, let's find out. This is my review of the original Jaws. Now, why did I put my among around? Alright, so same as the last episode and the original episode, I will be reading from the Wikipedia page, so bear with me, people. Uh, again, let's just hope my reading skills actually improved. I highly doubt that. Alright, so <clears throat> I'm going to be reading straight from the Wikipedia page, and forgive me for my stumbling from here and there. So bear with me, people, bear with me. So the plot goes as follows. During a beach party at dusk on Amity Island, New England, a young woman, Chrissy Watkins, goes skinny dipping in the ocean. Basically, you strip down to nothing and you go into the water naked. That's what skinny dipping is. While trending water, she's violently pulled under. The next day, she, mm, her partial remains are found on shore. The medical examiner's ruling that the death was due to a shark attack leads the police chief Martin Brody, played by Roy Scheider, to close the beaches. Mayor Larry Bobbin, played by Mary Hamilton, overrules him, fearing that the town's summer e economy will be ruined. The coroner now concurs with the mayor's theory that Christie was killed in a boating accident. Brody reluctantly accepts their conclusion until another fatal shark attack occurs shortly thereafter. Never open your goddamn mouth. That's rule 88. Right behind, right in front of rule 87, the common sense page. Think with your head instead of your ass. Anyway, a bounty is placed on the shark, prompting an amateur shark hunting frenzy. Local professional shark hunter Quint, played by... Sorry, I'm pausing. I'm trying to look up the actor. Ah, there we go. Played by Robert Shaw, offers his services for $10,000. Meanwhile, consulting the oceanography, Matt Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfus, examines Chrissy's remains and confirms her death was caused by a shark. An unusually large one. I wonder what it could be. Hmm. 
when local fishermen catch a tiger shark, the mayor proclaims the beaches are safe. Are you sure about that, dude? Hubert d- d- disputes that it is the same predator, confirming this after no human remains are found inside of it. Hooper and Brody find a half-sunken vessel while searching the night waters in Hooper's boat. Underwater, Hooper retrieves a sizable great white shark's tooth embedded in the submerged hull. He drops it in fright after encountering a partial corpse. What was that corpse doing there in the first place? Nah, I'll never know. Raffin discounts Brody and Hooper's statements that a huge great white shark is responsible for the deaths and refuses to close the beaches, allowing only added safety precautions. Dude, dude, how stubborn and greedy can you be? You'll give Mr. Krabs a run for his money. Jesus Christ. On the 4th of July weekend, tourists pack the beaches. While a juvenile prank in which the presence of a shark is simulated, the real shark enters a nearby, how do you even want to say this word? Estuary? Ah, whatever. Killing a boater and causes Brody's older son, Michael, to go into shock. Brody then convinces Vaffin, I don't know why it smelled like that, or said like that, eh, to hire Quint. See, that's all you had to do. All you had to do is see an actual shark, and then all of a sudden, you're like, okay, okay, where is that guy? And the only reason he did it is because his children was on the beach and were in the water. Yeah, remember I said it won't bite you in the ass? It kind of did. Quint, Brody, and Hoover are set on, on Quint's boat, the orca, wherever I heard that before, to hunt the shark. While Brody lays down a chum line, Quint waits for an opportunity to hook the shark. Without warning, it appears behind the boat. Surprise! Quint, estimating its length at 25 feet, approximately like 7.6 meters, and weighing at 3 tons, yikes, harpoons it with a line attached to a flotation barrel. But the shark pulls the barrel underwater and disappears. At nightfall, Quint and Hooper drunkenly exchange exchange their stories about their asserted scars, and Quint reveals that he survived at USS Indianapolis. That's actually a really cool scene. All three of them, all drunk, sharing stories, a shark returning returning unexpectedly. Wait, what? Oh, yeah. Mm. The shark returns unexpectedly, ramming the bolt's hull and disabling the power. The men work through the night, repairing the engine. In the morning time, Brody attempts to call the Coast Guard, but Quint, who has become obsessed with killing the shark without assistance, smashes the radio. Apparently, he became literal Moby Dick. Or Captain Ahab hunting Moby Dick. Excuse me for that. After a long chase, Quint harpoons another barrel into the shark. The line is tied to the stern cleats. But the shark drags the boat backward. How is it able to do that? Swamping the deck and floating, f- floating. Yeah, <laughs> he's floating the boat. No, he's flooding the engine compartment. There we go. Quint prepares the sev- to sever the line to prevent the transom from being pulled out, but the cleats break off, keeping the barrels attached to the shark. Quint heads towards shore to draw the shark into shallow waters, but he mm, intentionally pushes the damaged engine past the safety limits, and the overtaxed engines fail. Good job there, dude. With the orcas slowly sinking, the trio attempt a a riskier approach. Hooper puts a scuba gear on and enters enters the water in a shark-proof cage. You know, those those rectangular things that protect you from other sharks. You know, that kind of shark-proof cage. Intending to lethally inject the shark with I'm not even going to pronounce that word because it's too literal hard, using a a hyperdamic spear. The shark attacks the cage, causing Hooper, (laughs) out of fear, to drop the spear, which sinks and is lost. Good job holding on that thing, dude. Hooper, thankfully, manages to escape to the seabed. How did the shark not see him? I have no idea. Possibly he was literally too busy on the boat. Speaking of the boat... The shark then attacks the boat directly and devours Quint. Mm. 
karma, 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 karma. That's what you get for smashing that radio, get dunce. Trapped on the sinking vessel, Brody jams the... Pr- not even going to say that word. Pressurize, there we go. The scuba tank into the shark's mouth. And climbing in the crow's nest. That long pole that's called crow's nest on boats. Shoots the tank with a, with a rifle. An M1 Garand rifle. How do I know? Because I've actually seen an M1 Garand in video games and in real life. I'm not that dumb, people. The resulting explosion obliterates the shark. Hooper surfaces, and he and Brody paddle back to Amity Island, clinging to the remaining barrels. Whew. Jesus. Took a lot out of me. After this somewhat two-minute break, I'll give you my final thoughts. I'll be right back. So my overall thoughts, well, to keep it short, it is magnificent and an amazing, well-written story. No complaints here. Not a single frame or second was race- wasted. Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, and Richard Dreyfuss have amazing chemistry with each other. And all of the supporting actors and actresses are top-notch as well. A humongous improvement over the book. Spielberg has stated earlier that I pointed out that the characters in the original novel are so unlikable that that the reader wishes the characters would die by the shark. And I'm glad he actually changed the characters here. Mm. You are a genius. Speaking of geniuses, the effects are amazing. There are some shots that they actually use an actual great white shark for certain shots. Thank God that shark is an amazing actor. Top notch to that thing. And the way Spielberg toys with my emotions is astounding. And I love the idea that using yellow barrels as a way to see the shark without seeing the shark. Oh my goodness. The music by John Williams. (laughs) You know, this is a guy who will go on to compose the original Star Wars two years later. And his music in this movie is amazing. My favorite track out of all of them is when the shark is approaching the, sh- the cage underwater. Sadly, I will not play that track because Universal will be up my ass. <sighs> what the fuck, Universal? Overall, Jaws is a, fa- is a fantastic movie. The characters, the direction, the pacing, the effects, and the music are all fantastic. Would I recommend Jaws 1975 to you? Yes. 
Yes, I would. As I am honored to give this movie a maximum 100 humans on the shark menu out of 100. A must own movie. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll be going to a coma for nearly drowning to death. Remind me to kick Godzilla in the ass for leaving me in the middle of the ocean. But until then, for more thoughts and First Amendment opinions on movies, games, etc., stay tuned right here on the Bermackin Podcast. Stay tuned and subscribe to Bermackin Productions for, for more juicy content. This has been Demetrius signing off. <coughs> <coughs>